Now, for our last speaker in the first half, and giving our 100th Ignite talk here in Ann Arbor, he's a fiction writer that produces the Moth Story Slam in Ann Arbor. Let's have a big round of applause for Brian Short. I was working at a mid-tier sportswear shop where I folded neoprene leggings for eight-hour shifts. I was running late, so I parked in front of the cheapo department store, the one that puts the Dremels next to the crotchless panties. I was almost through into the main mall when a frizzy-headed gal shot out into the alley between the makeup counters, trying to fog me up with some off-brand cologne. I reached out to block her, and my hand brushed hers, and we switched, I mean, who we were, changed. It was like some moralizing teen comedy from the 1980s. Uh, our consciousnesses traded, and there I was, fumbling to catch the perfume mister before it smashed open, dosing my pumps with honeysuckle. I shook my head no and saw the woman's bleached hair swing in front of my eyes, hay straight with burnt tips, and I screamed. A security guard came to take me upstairs, and I popped inside of him, staring down at my coffee-dark hands, surprised how, at how heavy the gun was hanging on my hip. It was, it was happening all over, the switching, but we didn't know it then. Personalities changing over any point of contact, an Amtrak conductor passing change to a commuter, a parent ruffling a child's hair. At pep rallies and cocktail parties and church services, minds leapfrogged as strangers shared the peace, as friends embraced, fingertips tapping elbows, palms pressing neatly together in a handshake. After it became clear that what was happening was happening, the radios and the TVs all said to stop touching, but by then it was too late. When I found myself again, I was alone. In the men's room, imprisoned in a strange woman's body, squatting beside a toilet in a glossy gray pantsuit, my nails caked with gore, my saggy cheeks bloody. Going through my pockets, I found loose change and a stack of plain business cards. I called hello as I stepped into the office, and the frightened feeling I had been carrying with me since the switch swelled into something more profound as I stepped into a cubicle filled with photographs of my body hoisting a silver-purple fish into the air, of my body kneeling on the beach, dressed in khakis and a foamy sweater. Strangers filtered into the office, laughing anxiously. Out of habit or desperation, we worked or tried to. We were careful with our computers and each other, shy to talk, eager to listen. Months passed. I don't think any of us ever developed more than a vague idea of what the company we worked for actually produced, but it only took a few days to get the basics of what our responsibilities were, what documents we wrote or destroyed, where the replacement toner cartridges were stored, that kind of thing. Eventually, we began to feel like we weren't just pretending to belong where we were, except for Marjorie. Marjorie leapt out of her chair at any noise, the rattle of metal clips in a paper cup, the popping sound that the suction strip on the refrigerator door made when it opened. She refused to eat with us, to speak after 1 p.m., to stand within a dozen feet of a window. One day she came in wearing a leather miniskirt, go-go boots, and a platinum wig with a wad of what might have been mayonnaise stuck to the side of it. Some nights we drank at one of the junior partners' nearby industrial lofts. Listening to the exposed piping swish and gurgle and talking about Marjorie, how pity for her soaked our hearts, how her behavior must be some kind of phase that she was, that she had to be, harmless. Then we came in one morning and found her sitting on the Formica counter in the break room, stabbing her legs with scissors and knew that we had been wrong. A doctor and a policeman came together and told us that they would probably keep her, their words, for three months. And I'm sure they would have if Marjorie hadn't hung herself that night in her cell, the buckle of her belt tucked under her chin, eyes shut defiantly, toes pointing in. Huge questions loom, swamping us. Should I trust my neighbors? Who are my children and do they love me? Why do the president's clothes always look so big on him? Yesterday, I was on my way home from the office when I recognized my old body, those bony hips and flat, overbrushed hair. Stepping out of an ice cream shop, I stood, frozen, shocked. This is what we are left with, 
no affection, no sense of belonging to our bodies, just the cheap novelty of catching ourselves in the act of doing something ordinary, a modest shock, and then the long, lumpy aftermath. Thank you. Thank you, Brian.